Chapter Twenty Nine of Our Village, Volume One, by Mary Russell Mitford, read by Anne Fletcher, Hobart, Two Thousand and Twenty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our Village, Volume One, Chapter Twenty Nine, Mrs. Moss. I do not know whether I ever hinted to the courteous reader that I had been in my younger days, without prejudice to my present condition, somewhat of a spoiled child the person who next after my father and mother contributed most materially to this melancholy catastrophe was an old female domestic mrs elizabeth moss who at the time of her death had lived nearly sixty years in our house and that of my maternal grandfather of course during the latter part of this long period the common forms and feelings of a servant and master were entirely swept away she was a member of the family a humble friend happy are they who have such a friend living as she liked upstairs or down in the kitchen or the nursery considered consulted and beloved by the whole household mossy for by that fondling nursery name she best liked to be called had never been married so that the family of her master and mistress had no rival in her heart and on me their only child was concentrated that intensity of affection which distinguishes the attachments of age i loved her dearly too as dearly as a spoiled child can love its prime spoiler oh, but oh how selfish was my love compared to the depth and the purity the indulgence the self-denial of hers dear mossy i shall never do her justice and yet i must try mrs moss in her appearance was in the highest degree what is called respectable she must have been tall when young for even when bent with age she was above the middle height a large maid though meagre woman she walked with feebleness and difficulty from the attacks of hereditary gout which not even her temperance and activity could ward off there was something very interesting in this tottering helplessness clinging to the balusters or holding by doors and chairs like a child it had nothing of vulgar lameness it told of age venerable age out of doors she seldom ventured unless on some sunny afternoon i could entice her into the air and then once around the garden or to the lawn gate and back again was the extent of her walk propped by a very aristocratic walking-stick once the property of a duchess as tall as herself with a hooked ivory handle joined to the cane by a rim of gold her face was as venerable as her person she must have been very handsome indeed she was so still as far as regular and delicate features a pale brown complexion and dark eyes still retaining the intelligence and animation of youth and an expression perfectly gentle and feminine could make her so it is one of the worst penalties that woman pays to age but often when advanced in life the face loses its characteristic softness in short but for the difference in dress many an old woman's head might pass for that of an old man this misfortune could never have happened to mossy no one could mistake the sex of that sweet countenance her dress manifested a good deal of laudable coquetry a nice and minute attention to the becoming i do not know at what precise date her costume was fixed but as long as i remember her fixed it was and stood as invariably at one point of fashion as the hand of an unwound clock stands at one hour of the day it consisted to begin from the feet and describe upwards of black shoes of shining stuff with very pointed toes high heels and a peak up the instep showing to advantage her delicately white cotton stockings and peeping beneath petticoats so numerous and substantial as to give a rotundity and projection almost equal to a hoop her exterior garment was always quilted varying according to the season or the occasion from simple stuff or fine white dimity or an obsolete manufacture called marseilles up to silk and satin for as the wardrobes of my three grandmothers oh sure i mean my grandfather's three wives had fallen to her lot few gentlewomen of the last century could boast a greater variety of silks that stood on end 
over the quilted petticoat came an open gown whose long waist reached the bottom of her stiff stays and whose very full tail about six inches longer than the petticoat would have formed a very inconvenient little train if it had been permitted to hang down but that inconvenience never happened and could scarcely have been contemplated by the designer the tail was constantly looped up so as to hang behind in a sort of bunchy festoon exhibiting on each side the aforesaid petticoat in material the gown also varied with the occasion although it was always either composed of dark cotton or of the rich silks and satins of my grandmamma's wardrobe the sleeves came down just below the elbow and were finished by a narrow white ruffle meeting her neat mittens on her neck she wore a snow-white double muslin kerchief pinned over the gown in front and confined by an apron also of muslin and over all a handsome silk shawl so pinned back as to show a part of the snowy neckerchief her headdress was equally becoming and more particularly precise for if ever she betrayed an atom of old maidishness it was on the score of her caps from a touch of the gout in her hands which had enlarged and stiffened the joints she could do no work which required nicety and the successive ladies maids on whom the operation devolved used to say that they would rather make up ten caps for their mistress than one for mrs moss and yet the construction seemed simple enough a fine plain clear starch call sticking up rather high and peaked in front was plaited on a scotch gauze headpiece i remember there used to be exactly six plaits on each side woe to the damsel who should put more or less and on the other side a border consisting of a strip of fine muslin edged with narrow lace clear starched and crimped was plaited on with equal precision in one part of this millinery i used to assist i dearly loved to crimp mossy's frills and she with her usual indulgence used frequently to let me however keeping a pretty close eye on her laces and muslins while i was passing them with triumphant rapidity between the small wooden machine not longitudinally and the corresponding roller perhaps a greater proof of indulgence could hardly have been shown since she must during this operation have been in double fear for her own cap strips which did occasionally get a rent and for my fingers which were sometimes well pinched then she would threaten that i should never crimp her muslin again a never which seldom lasted beyond the next cap making the headpiece was then concealed by a satin ribbon fastened in a peculiar bow something between a bow and a puffing behind while the front was adorned with an equally peculiar small knot of which the two bows were pinned down flat and the two ends left sticking up cut into scallops of a prodigious regularity the purchase of the ribbons formed another branch of the cap-making department to which i laid claim from the earliest period at which i could distinguish one colour from another i had been purveyor of ribbons to mossy and indeed at all fairs or whenever i received a present or entered a shop and i was so liberally supplied that there was nothing like generosity in the case it was the first and pleasantest destination of money that occurred to me so that the dear woman used to complain that miss bought her so many ribbons that they spoiled in keeping we did not quite agree either in our taste white as both acknowledged was the only wear for sunday and holidays but then she loved plain white and i couldn't always control a certain wandering inclination for figured patterns and pearl edges if mossy had an aversion to anything it was to a pearl edge i never could persuade her to wear that simple piece of finery but once and then she made as many wry faces as a child eating olives and stood before a glass eyeing the obnoxious ribbon with so much discomposure that i was fain to take it out myself and promised to buy no more pearl edges the everyday ribbons were coloured and there too we had our little differences of taste and opinion both agreed in the propriety of grave colours but then my reading of a grave colour was not always the same as hers my eyes were not old enough 
she used to accuse my french greys of blueness and my crimsons of redness and my greens of their greenness she had a penchant for brown and to brown i had a repugnance only to be equalled by that which she professed towards a pearl edge indeed i retain my dislike to this hour it's such an exceedingly cross and frumpish looking colour and then it's ugliness show me a brown flower no i couldn't bring myself to buy brown so after fighting many battles about grey and green we at last settled on purple as a sort of neutral tint a hue which pleased both parties to return to the cap which we have been so long making the finish both to that and to my description was a strip of crimped muslin with edging on both sides to match the border quilled on a piece of tape and fastened on the cap at each ear this she called the shinum a straight short row of hair rather grey but still very dark for her age just appeared under the plaited lace and a pair of silver mounted spectacles completed her equipment if i live to the age of seventy i will dress so too with an exception of the stiff stays only a waist native to the fashion could endure that whalebone armour her employments were many and various no work was required of her from her mistress but idleness was a misery to her habits of active usefulness and it was astonishing how much those crippled fingers could do she preferred coarse needlework as it was least difficult to her eyes and hands and she attended also to those numerous and undefined avocations of a gentleman's family which come under the denomination of odd jobs shelling peas paring apples splitting french beans washing china darning stockings hemming and mending dusters and housecloths making cabbage nets and knitting garters these were her daily avocations the amusements which she loved the only more delicate operation of needlework that she ever undertook was the making of pincushions a manufacture in which she delighted not the quips and quiddities of these degenerate days little bits of ribboned and pasteboard and gilt paper in the shape of books or butterflies by which at charitable repositories half a dozen pins are smuggled into a lady's pocket and shillings and half crowns are smuggled out no mosses were real solid old-fashioned silken pincushions such as autolycus might have carried about amongst his peddlery ware square and roomy and capable at a moderate computation of containing a whole paper of short whites and another of middlings it was delightful to observe her enjoyment of this playwork the conscious importance with which she produced her satins and brocades and her cards of sewing silks she generally made a whole batch at once the deliberation with which she assorted the colours the care with which she tacked and fitted side to side and corner to corner the earnestness with which when all was sewed up except one small aperture for the insertion of the stuffing she would pour in the bran or stow in the wool and then the care with which she poked the stuffing into every separate corner ramming it down with all her strength and making the little bags so to say hold more than it would hold until it became almost as hard as a cricket ball then how she drew the aperture together by main force putting so many last stitches and fastening off with such care and then distributing them to all around her for her ladylike spirit would have scorned the idea of selling them and always reserving the gayest and prettiest for me dear old soul i have several of them still but if i should begin to enumerate all the instances of kindness which i experienced at her hands through the changes and varieties of a troublesome childhood and fantastic youth from the time when i was a puling baby to the still more exacting state of a young girl at home in the holidays i should never know when to end her sweet and loving temper was self-rewarded she enjoyed the happiness she gave those were pleasant evenings when my father and mother were engaged in the christmas dinner visits of a gay and extensive neighbourhood and mrs moss used to put on her handsomest shawl and her kindest smile and totter upstairs to drink tea with me and keep me company <laughs> 
from those evenings i imbibed in the first place a love of strong green tea for which gentlewomanly excitation mossy had a remarkable predilection and secondly a very discreditable and unladylike partiality which i am quite ashamed which i keep a secret from my most intimate friends and wouldn't mention for the world a sort of sneaking kindness for her favourite game of cribbage an old-fashioned vulgarity which in my mind beats the genteeler pastimes of whist and piquet and every game except quadrille out and out i make no exception in favour of chess because thanks to my stupidity i never could learn that recondite diversion moreover judging from the grave faces and fatiguing silence of the initiated i cannot help suspecting that board for board we cribbage players are as well amused as they dear mossy could neither feel to deal and shuffle nor see to peg so that the greater part of the business fell to my share the success was pretty equally divided three rubbers were our stint and we were often game and game in the last before victory declared itself she was very anxious to beat certainly note we never played for anything she liked to win and yet she didn't quite like that i should lose if we could both have won if it had been four-handed cribbage and she my partner still there would have been somebody to be beaten and pitied but then that somebody would not have been miss the cribbage hour was pleasant but i think the hours of chat which preceded and followed it were pleasanter still mossy was a most agreeable companion sensible and modest simple shrewd with an exactness of recollection and honesty of memory that gave exceeding interest to her stories you were sure that you heard the truth there was one striking peculiarity in her manner of talking or rather one striking contrast the voice and accent were quite those of a gentlewoman as sweet-toned and correct as could be the words and their arrangement were altogether those of a common person provincial and ungrammatical in every phrase and combination i believe it's an effect of association from the little slips in her grammar that i have contracted a most unscholarly like prejudice in favour of false syntax which is so connected in my mind with right notions that i no sooner catch the sound of bad english than i begin to listen for good sense and really they often go together always supposing that the bad english be not of the order called slang they meet much more frequently than those exclusive people ladies and gentlemen are willing to allow in her they were always united but the charm of her conversation was in the old family stories and the unconscious peeps at old manners which they afforded my grandfather with whom she had lived in his first wife's time full twenty years before my mother's birth was a most respectable clergyman who after passing a few years in london amongst the wits and poets of the day seeing the star of pope in its decline and that of johnson in its rise had retired into the country where he held two adjoining livings of considerable value both of which he served for above forty years until the duty becoming too severe he resigned one of them under an old-fashioned notion that he who did the duty ought to receive the remuneration i am very proud of my venerable ancestor we have a portrait of him taken shortly after he was ordained in his gown and band with a curious flowing wig something like that of a judge fashionable doubtless at the time but which at present rather discomposes one's notions of clerical costume he seems to have been a dark little man with a sensible countenance and a pair of black eyes that even in the picture look you through he was a votary of the muses too a contributor to lewis's miscellany did my readers ever hear of that collection translated horace as all gentlemen do and wrote love verses which had the unusual good fortune of obtaining their object being as mrs moss was wont to affirm the chief engine and implement by which at fifty he gained the heart of his third wife my real grandmamma the beautiful daughter of a neighbouring squire of dr r his wives and his sermons the bishop who visited and the poets who wrote to him mossy's talk was mainly composed chiefly of the wives <laughs>
mrs r the first was a fine london lady a widow and considerably older than her spouse inasmuch as my grandpapa's passion for her commenced when he and her son by a former husband were schoolfellows at westminster mrs moss never talked much of her and i suspect did not much like her though when closely questioned she would say that madam was a fine portly lady stately and personable but rather too high her son made a sad mesalliance he ran away with the sexton's daughter an adventure which cost the sexton his post and his mother her pride she never looked up after it that disgrace and a cold caught by bumping on a pillion six miles through the rain sent her to her grave of the second mrs r little remains on record except a gown and petticoat of primrose silk curiously embossed and embroidered with gold and silver thread and silks of all colours in an enormous running pattern of staring flowers wonderfully unlike nature also various recipes in the family receipt book which show a delicate italian hand and a bold originality of orthography the chief event of her married life appears to have been the smallpox she and two of her sisters and mrs moss were all inoculated together the other servants who had not gone through the disorder were sent out of the house dr r himself took refuge with a neighbouring friend and the patients were consigned to the care of two or three nurses gossips by profession hired from the next town the best parlour in those days drawing-rooms were not was turned into a hospital a quarantine almost as strict as would be required in the plague was kept up and the preparation the disease and the recovery consumed nearly two months mrs moss always spoke of it as one of the pleasantest passages of her life none of them suffered much there was nothing to do plenty of gossiping a sense of self-importance such as all prisoners must feel more or less and for amusement they had pamela the spectator and sir charles grandison my grandfather had a very fine library but sir charles was a female book having been purchased by the joint contributions of six young ladies and circulated amongst them once a year sojourning two months with each fair partner till death or marriage broke up the coterie isn't that fame well the second mrs r died in the course of time though not of the smallpox and my grandfather faithful to his wives but not to their memories married again as usual his third adventure in that line was particularly happy for my grandmother besides being a celebrated beauty appears to have been one of the best and kindest women that ever gladdened a country home she had a large household for the tithes of one rich rectory were taken in kind and the glebe cultivated so that the cares of a farmhouse were added to the hospitality of a man of good fortune and to the sort of stateliness which in those primitive days appertained to a doctor of divinity the superintendence of that large household seems to have been at once her duty and her delight it was a plenty and festivity almost resembling that of camacho's wedding guided by a wise and liberal economy and a spirit of indefatigable industry oh the saltings the picklings the preservings and cake makings the unnamed and unnameable confectionery doings over which she presided the very titles of her territories denoted the extent of her stores the apple room the pear bin the cheese loft the minced meat closet were household words as familiar in mossy's mouth as the dairy or the poultry yard and my grandmamma was no hoarder for hoarding's sake no maker of good things which were not to be eaten as i have sometimes noted amongst your managing ladies the object of her cares and stores was to contribute to the comfort of all who came within her influence the large parsonage house was generally overflowing with guests and from the oxford professor who with his wife children servants and horses passed his vacations there to the poor pew opener who came with her little ones at tide times all felt the charm of her smiling graciousness her sweet and cheerful spirit her open hand and open heart <laughs> 
it is difficult to imagine a happier couple than my venerable grandfather and his charming wife he retained to the last his studious habits his love of literature and his strong and warm family affections while she cast the sunshine of her innocent gaiety over his respectable age proud of his scholarship and prouder still of his virtues both died long ago but mossy was an honest chronicler and never weary of her theme even the daily airings of the good doctor who in spite of his three wives had a little of the peculiar preciseness in his studies and his exercise which one is apt to attribute exclusively to that dreary person an old bachelor even those airings from twelve to two four miles on the turnpike road and four miles back with the fat horses and the grey-haired coachman became vivid and characteristic in her description the very carriage dog sancho was individualized we felt that he belonged to the people and to the time of these things we talked mingled with many miscellaneous anecdotes of the same date how an electioneering duke saluted madam and lost master's interest by the freedom how sir thomas s the lovelace of his day came in his chariot and six full twenty miles out of his way to show himself to miss fanny in a spanish masquerade dress white satin slashed with blue a blue cloak embroidered with silver and point lace that might have won any woman's heart except that of his fair but obdurate mistress and lastly how henry fielding when on a visit in the neighbourhood had been accustomed to come and swing the children in the great barn he had even swung mossy herself to her no small edification and delight only think of being chucked backwards and forwards by the man who wrote about parson adams and squire allworthy i used to envy her that felicity then from authors we got to books she could not see in my time to read anything but the folio bible and common prayer book with which my dear mother had furnished her but in her younger days she had seen or heard parts at least of a variety of books and entered into them with a very keen though uncritical relish her chief favourites were the pilgrim's progress don quixote gulliver's travels robinson crusoe and the equally apocryphal but still truer seeming history of the plague in london by the same author all of which she believed with the most earnest simplicity i used frequently to read to her the passages she liked best and she in her turn would repeat to me songs and ballads good bad and indifferent a strange medley and strangely confounded in her memory and so the time passed till ten o'clock those were pleasant evenings for her and me i have sometimes on recollection feared that her downstair life was less happy all that the orders of a mistress could effect for her comfort was done but we were rich then unluckily and there were skipjacks of footmen and surly coachmen and affected waiting-maids and vixenish cooks with tempers red-hot like their coals to vex and tease our dear old woman she must have suffered greatly between her ardent zeal for her master's interest and that strange principle of concealing evil doings which servants call honour and of which she was perpetually the slave and the victim she had another infirmity too an impossibility of saying no which added to an unbounded generosity of temper rendered her the easy dupe of the artful and the designing she would give anything to the appearance of want or the pretence of affection in short to importunity however clothed it was the only point of weakness in her character and to watch that she did not throw away her own little comforts to protect her from the effects of her over-liberality was the chief care of her mistress three inferior servants were successively turned away for trespassing on mossy's goodness drinking her green tea eating her diet bread and begging her gowns but the evil was incurable she could dispense with any pleasure except that of giving so she lived on beloved as the kind the gentle and the generous must be till i left school an event that gave her great satisfaction <laughs>
we passed the succeeding spring in london and she took the opportunity to pay a long promised visit to a half-nephew and niece or rather a half-niece and her husband who lived in princes street barbican mrs beck one naturally mentions her first as the person of most consequence was the only real woman who ever came up to the magnificent abstract idea of the fat woman of brentford the only being for whom sir john falstaff might have passed undetected she was indeed a mountain of flesh exuberant rubicund and bearded like a man and she spoke in a loud deep mannish voice a broad wiltshire dialect but she was hearty and jovial withal a thorough good fellow in petticoats mr beck on the other hand was a little insignificant perking sharp-featured man with a jerry sneak expression in his pale way face a thin squeaking voice and a cockney accent he had been lucky enough to keep a little shop in an independent borough at the time of a violently contested election and having adroitly kept back his vote till votes rose to their full value hope this is no breach of privilege and then voted on the stronger side he was at the time of which i speak comfortably settled in the excise as a tide waiter had a neat pretty house brought up his family in good repute wore a flaming red waistcoat attended a dissenting meeting and owed no man a shilling these good people were very fond of their aunt who had indeed before they were so well off shown them innumerable kindnesses perhaps there might be in the case a little gratitude for favours to come for she had three or four hundred pounds to bequeath partly her own savings and partly a legacy from a distant relative and they were her natural heirs however that might be they paid her all possible attention and when we were about to return into the country petitioned so vehemently for a few weeks more that yielding to the above-mentioned infirmity she consented to stay i had myself been the ambassadress to barbican to fetch our dear old friend and i remember as if it were yesterday how earnestly i entreated her to come with me and how seriously i lectured mrs beck for her selfishness in wishing to keep her aunt in london during the heat of june i even after taking leave sprang out of the carriage and ran again upstairs to persuade her to come with me mossy's wishes were evidently on my side but she had promised and the performance of her promise was peremptorily claimed so with a heavy heart i left her i never saw her again there is surely such a thing as presentiment a violent attack of gout in the stomach carried her off in a few hours hail to thy memory for thou wast of the antique world when service swept for duty, not for need. End of chapter 29